afternoon, everyone uh, that is here. My name is Dr. Onas Mukari. I am a member of the Progressive uh, Pro Professionals Forum, which is an organization comprising of uh, uh, the different professionals from different sectors. You get the healthcare workers, you get lawyers, you get accountants, uh, mainly professionals from different uh, sectors. Uh, we represent, we've got representation in all provinces uh, in the country. Uh, today we are here, invited by the African National Congress <coughs> on the program ANC uh, Connect uh, podcast. I'm here as a facilitator. We're having two guests. And our main guest is the Minister, National Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Joe Pata. Minister, uh, you are welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for having me in this program. You're welcome, Minister. Our second guest is uh, Comrade Simpiwe Gada, who is the chairperson of DINOSA in Gauteng. DINOSA is a democratic, uh, democratic nursing organization, organization South in South Africa. We have the chairperson who are representing nurses is also here with us. We are here mainly for the national health insurance. Last night, all of us got the good news when we saw the media statement from the presidency that uh, on Wednesday, the 15th of May, 2024, a historic moment in the history of healthcare in our country, whereby the president is going to sign the National Health Bill into, into law. As we all know, the National Health Insurance is not something new. As the African National Congress, when you go through the resolutions of the African National Congress, the first resolution for the, for, the, for the national health implementation of the national health insurance was in 2007 in Pulukwan. And in 2012, in Mangau, uh, a resolution on the national health insurance, but then it had time frames that it has to the ANC, the employees of the ANC in government must ensure the implementation of the national health insurance. And in 2011, processes in parliament started. If you recall, from the green paper, the white paper, and different stages in parliament, uh, it happened uh, during that, uh, that period. In 2017, the National Conference of the ANC took a resolution, again, about the implementation of the National Health Insurance. But in that resolution, the resolution was very clear that the, the ANC government, which is, we were at that time in 2017, we we're going for elections in 2019, that the ANC government must ensure that in the next term, which was the sixth term, the, the, the ANC government must ensure that the national health insurance goes through the processes of parliament and that is signed into law. In 2019, the, in the manifesto of the ANC, the, what the ANC promised the people of South Africa in the term where we are now, because we're in the sixth term, in this term, in the manifesto of the, of the African National Congress, the manifesto was clear in terms of what is expected of government and what was promised to the people of South Africa, that by the end of this term, the, the national health insurance must be signed into law. So what is happening tomorrow is not something that started yesterday or last month. It started in 2007, and tomorrow is a culmination of the processes of the African National Congress and the ANC-led government to ensure that the national health insurance becomes law. It is a milestone tomorrow, and it's an important day for the people of South Africa. It's got implications. We have got our guests here who will be able to share with us what national health insurance is all about. We know that many of our people are reading about it, especially this week, because it's going to be signed. So we'll have our guests who will be able to outline what the national health insurance is all about and of importance, what is the implication beyond tomorrow after the president has signed it into, into, into law and how will it impact on different sectors of our population? How will the signing of the national health insurance impact on the poor? 
how will it impact on the working class and the middle class? What will be the role of medical aid? How will it impact on the human resources, the workforce of healthcare workers? We're very privileged to also have the, uh, the chairperson of DENOSA, DENOSA with us. So this is what we want to impact so that as the bill is signed tomorrow, we can be able to share most of the information with, uh, with our people. I would like to start with the, with the minister. Minister, if you can just give us an overview of what the NHI is all about and what will be the implication of the signing of the bill tomorrow. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, put in, in very uh, simple terms, uh, the NHI is uh, an instrument through which, as South Africans, we want to achieve universal health coverage. And then the question would be, what does in, in universal health coverage entail? Again, in, in very simple terms, universal health coverage entails that all citizens of a country should have equal access to whatever health resources are available in the country. And fundamentally, also saying that uh, that access, which must be equitable, must, at the point of service, be free of any payment. Um, to and make sure that no citizen of such a country, in this case, uh, this is an instrument for our country, to make sure that uh, no citizen, when they require medical attention, have to worry about whether they've got the necessary financial resources. So that's basically uh, uh, the, the, the purpose of, of uh, the National Health Insurance. I must add to say that, um, as, as uh, the moderator has indicated, this has been an aspiration of the people of South Africa for many decades. It's been part and parcel of the aspirations of our liberation struggle over many years, starting in the 40s. It's been expressed in various documents which set up, which, which, which put uh, to the front the aspirations of the majority of South Africans. Also just to add that we are also not unique in this aspiration. It is an aspiration which is also you know, uh, captured in various resolutions of various multilateral organizations to which South Africa is a member. Starting with the overarching one, which is the United Nations Organization, and also its substructure, which is the World Health Organization. If you go into conferences and uh, uh, resolutions of these agencies and also other substructures, you will find to, you know, various resolutions in this regard. So heads of state under the United Nations organization have committed in front of each other. On several occasions, I can just mention that not very far ago in September last year, I went to the UN with uh, President Ramaphosa uh, amongst the issues which were in, at the center of the assembly uh, under what is called the high level uh, meetings of the heads of state. The Secretary General had put in the agenda commitment of member nations to achieving universal health coverage. It is also captured uh, in the strategic development goals which were adopted by all member states in 2015 for achievement by 2030. Uh, under uh, Section 3, uh, uh, SDG number 3, there, there, is as, there is also commitments there, and that is why the UN also has, has, has adopted that, and that's why member countries have to report. So essentially, that's what it entails, that uh, when, when it is implemented in this case, so the NHI uh, being a pooling of the funds by all citizens, uh, those who have income, those who you know, must contribute over and above the general taxation which uh, everybody contributes to. That's how it works in various countries which have implemented the, uh, similar schemes. So that's basically and, and to protect citizens that they must have equal access and when they, uh, when they get that service, there must be no financial 
you know, catastrophe uh, uh, which can befall them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister, for your clarification. Uh, I'll just make a follow-up uh, question on that. Uh, currently, our people, especially the poor and the, and the middle class who do not uh, have medical aid, they rely on uh, public, uh, at, at the primary health care level, they rely on the public clinics and the public hospitals. But going there, the public clinics are overcrowded. The hospitals are also overcrowded. But the National Health Insurance Bill speaks about that uh, 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 anyone based on the health needs can be able to use public and private uh, service providers. I think our people would like to understand now that uh, will they be, with the National Health Insurance, will they be able to, instead of going to a clinic, go and see a general practitioner who is closer to them? Or with the National Health Insurance, will they be able to be referred to a private hospital uh, that is nearest to them? I think it is of importance for our people to understand that and as to what will be the cost of them doing so. If you can clarify that, Minister. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for that question. Indeed, what the NHI wants to create a framework for is to make sure that uh, uh, as a country with uh, vast resources, we have quite a big network in the public health uh, service provision. Uh, from the primary health side, we have got, we've made sure, thanks to the democratic government since 1994, we have expanded a lot of primary health services, including also at district hospitals, but of course there's still a, a, a need for further expansion. But the, the disadvantage of the current system, which is a two-tier system, is that at the same time, um, the private provision right from primary level, right up to uh, district and also uh, on the specialist services level, it, it's existing parallel with the public health system. So what this, you know, wants to achieve is to make sure that the vast resources which are also sitting on the private side, starting at the primary level, uh, all of us know that there is a lot of, at the primary level, starting with doctors, a lot of general practitioners, uh, as a country, we have trained a lot of uh, the doctors over the years, increased a lot of capacity. Uh, now, those resources uh, in terms of the GPs, we've got uh, physiotherapists, we've got uh, dental therapists, dentists, we've got uh, dietitians, uh, we've got uh, audiologists. But because of our, our divided system, many of those are sitting you know, on their own or serving very small numbers of people uh, because in terms of our current arrangement, those who have uh, private uh, uh, medical schemes are the only ones who are able to pay for some of those services. So by pulling the funds together, we will be able to reorganize so that uh, the public service, which is catering for 85%, uh, with, the, with, with limited resources in the sense that majority of those who make additional contribution only is spent by about 15% of the population through the, the current arrangement. By opening up, by making sure that the funds are controlled uh, in, the, in one center, we will be able to then bring into the service all that plethora of professionals who are trained uh, and, and we are trained by the very public system because uh, whether you talk about doctors, physiotherapists, they are trained in our public universities and techni techni uh, technical colleges and so on and colleges. Uh, so we want to, through this scheme, it will be possible then that all of them in a particular area, there are areas which are underserviced and they are underserviced because of the fact that there are very few people who are on these private medical schemes. So through this, by making sure that uh, the population in a particular area is allocated a particular 
a, a budget to say if you have a community of say 100,000 at the primary health level, these are the kind of resources which are available to provide primary health uh, through clinics, but also in the clinics, uh, we also don't want to be starting from scratch. Already many of the clinics already have uh, some uh, medical officers. But we will be able to expand to bring into the service just uh, this, uh, what people are quite familiar with, your general practitioners who are in the area to be part and parcel of the network. Uh, where, for instance, in, even especially in rural areas, you may not have you know, somebody is injured when they need physiotherapy. Currently, they have to go to the nearest town. But when you have a pooled funds like that, in your basket of primary services, because the, uh, a physiotherapist who's qualified can set up even in a village because they know that they are not going to depend only on people who have got income because the population in the area, there will be funds which they can contract for physiotherapy services, for speech therapy, for all sorts of you know, occupational therapy and all those. They will all be part and parcel of a basket as long as you can be shown to be qualified to can provide that service. So we will be able through that uh, system. But what I must, I must also just emphasize is the fact that for you to achieve that equity and efficiency, you do need to be organized. So we must not say some things which may become problematic uh, in the sense that for, 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 for that to, to work properly, there will have to be some order. So all of us and, uh, will be expected to, to be registered uh, and you can register at the clinic uh, and you don't have to do it every time. You can register with a GP who's contracted and ordinarily uh, when you first need some assessment, you will be expected to start there, either with your clinic uh, where there will be not only nurses but also doctors and others will be available or even start with your GP in the area. And if you then, if they then determine that you need further you know, treatment, they will assess because we, we, we already have, I can just indicate, we have, we have started already what is called a master facility uh, plan health plan where a, 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 a recording system we started during the COVID, where we recorded all the services on gps you know our we've got a system in the office where you can tell that uh, dr mkari is in shawela or in snawani uh, this is this practice has got so many nurses this is the services they provide so we're going to build up on that so when once somebody needs care they can then be directed to say your nearest is this area, please get registered. When you have something, please start there. And, but if you happen to fall ill when you are somewhere else, you can go to the nearest facility. But unless if it's an absolute emergency, start with your primary. And then they will be able to guide you to say, no, you need this, you need that, and so on. Just so that there is a bit of order. But everybody will have uh, access and they will know exactly in terms of uh, in the area where they reside, this is the nearest GP, this is the clinics, uh, so that, for instance, if the clinic is too busy, there's a GP nearby who, as long as they are registered, they can go to that GP. Uh, from there onwards, of course, if they need some emergency service, there's a hospital nearby. And if, the, if the, both the public and private hospital, uh, if they're both, I mean, the, the public, all the public facilities, yeah. we expect that they will be part of the system provided that they, need, they meet the standard. Even, the, mm -hmm. even our managers must check up in the public service mm -hmm. because they must, for them to, to be accredited, they will need certain standards. Mm -hmm. I can just give you an example, for instance, just on how some of the things. For instance, with the, uh, I'm just coming from George on Friday mm -hmm. with the collapse of the building. So what happened there is uh, the alarm is rung, all health professionals are informed, but the first call is the public hospital. The public hospital sees, oh, there are so many ambulances. Then they contact the private uh, hospital. Can you help? And they say, yes, we do have people here. We've got rooms and so on. Then some of them are directed. But it's just ad hoc now. Mm -hmm. So in a situation like that, it would not be ad hoc. It will be part and parcel of an organized system. Mm -hmm. Sorry for taking long, but that's, mm -hmm. that's really mm -hmm. just to give a sense of how it works. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for, for actually unpacking that. Uh, what, what it all means is that uh, everyone 
will have uh, access to the nearest hospital facility, whether that facility is private or public. Even in case of emergency, as you have said, Minister, is that uh, if there's an emergency, uh, uh, anyone can go to the nearest facility as long as that facility is accredited. I think that's, that's what you have emphasized and, and clarified uh, uh, for us. Uh, Minister, there's obviously a concern by many in terms of the state of our public hospitals. Many people think that uh, uh, the, we speak of accreditation. I think you have correctly said that even the public facilities, they must catch up their game, meaning that they have to conform to certain uh, 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 standards to be able to be accredited by, 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 by the National Health Insurance. Our understanding is that if they don't conform to those standards, they cannot be a service provider. Uh, from the government point of view, what, what is the plan to ensure that the, most of our facilities are ready to be able to conform to those standards? Well, um, the, the process of, of uh, making sure that there is improvement of the service pro, uh, uh, pro, provision uh, platform started quite some time ago and we are, we are you know, pushing that that should be accelerated. Um, just to uh, say, for instance, there was a bit of a misunderstanding some time, uh, some years back, when the department spoke about uh, NHI pilots. Now, what was the essential issue of the various districts, which were, it was really piloting interventions in terms of health system strengthening, which can now, as the bill gets uh, aside, can now be rolled out to all the facilities. Uh, so there's been investment already. Uh, in terms of strengthening uh, the facilities uh, at the infrastructure level, at the equipment level, health information systems, there's already been a significant investment in that area. Just in terms of infrastructure, um, on the annual basis, uh, roughly we spend just over 9 billion rand with beyond what provinces can use from their own what is called equitable share. When the budget is allocated uh, by Treasury, there is a certain amount which give, was given to each province according to various formula. Uh, the, form, the, the province also knows that a certain percentage must go to health. It must provide salaries, uh, consumables, and also infrastructure upgrade and so on. But in making sure that, because when there are pressures of various kinds, salary increases and so on, we know that the infrastructure and equipment may suffer. So we then negotiated some few years ago under the preparatory work from NHI that the Treasury must make available a national grant through which, as a national department, based on the business plans from each province, we can support them in terms of infrastructure. So we have two uh, pockets, one just over 7 billion, I think currently in the current financial estimate about 7.2 billion per annum. Not, uh, not much here mm -hmm. uh, per annum. And then another one which is about 1.3 billion, so it's all about 8.5 8 billion right, all in all, which provinces then, the first one, the, the bigger one, the 7.2, 7.3, provinces apply on the basis of their uh, annual in, in, you know, business plans to upgrade facilities, and then we allocate and they must implement, and we monitor uh, to see that the, uh, the projects are actually moving. And then the smaller one, was more into the, the, the areas, the districts which were identified as pilots for, for, for strength. So over and above what everybody else shares to accelerate that ex uh, experience in the, in the 10 pilot areas. We also allocate additionally, and in those ones, we work together, the, the national and province, but the national infrastructure team actually is more directly involved in even managing together with the province those programs. So as a result of that, you would, you would be aware that uh, almost in every province, I mean, you'll find I mean, state-of-the-art new clinics. Um, I mean, uh, mm. they have just been destabilized yeah. by the signing tomorrow. Mm. I was supposed to be in Vembe, in Limpopo, mm. mm. to open a state-of-the-art uh, clinic, uh, which meets all the standards of mm. the NHI. A few weeks ago, I was in mm. Balfour, in Pomalanga, where we were opening almost we're debating whether it's correct to call it a clinic because it competes very mm. well with the number of hospitals. Mm. Uh, I mean, with all modern x-rays, 
modern equipment, mm. digital X-ray equipment, and all other modern technology, uh, information systems, digital information systems. So these processes have been rolled out. What will be required, it's in a more concerted fashion to accelerate that, mm. and that's why, amongst other things, we discussing to say, give mm. us more, mm. uh, and we're looking at even beyond just the ordinary budget allocation, what are the mm. other possible sources? so that we can accelerate, uh, so that the public health, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the experience is there. We've got the, you know, we just need to increase the capacity, but over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, or, or just over 10 years, uh, we have already have a lot of experience in terms of even where we can do these things even more cost effectively. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the, the, the acceleration mm -hmm. of uh, uh, equipment, infrastructure, mm -hmm. including uh, maintenance and all that, it's already, we have the experience already. Okay. Hey, Minister, thank you, thank you very much for clarifying find that in terms of the quality that uh, indeed uh, the, the government uh, has, a, has a plan, especially now that uh, uh, the bill will be signed into law, that the process of quality improvement plan of facilities, whether these new facilities or upgrading of facilities will be accelerated so that they meet the kind of standards that you you, you, you have spoken about. I think when we read the bill, it also speaks about the Office of the Health Standard Compliance, which it says that, look, standardize uh, the standard, whether it's public or private. So uh, the minister is assuring that even the public facilities will be of the same standard as the private facility. So people mustn't feel that the current state, the current state, people feel that the private sector, the standard is low, but with the implementation and the acceleration, it will be of, of the same standards. Uh, we, th we thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Minister. And the last question, Minister, will be uh, South Africans, after signing, some South Africans can think that uh, on the tomorrow is uh, the 20, is the 15th. From the 16th, it will start waking. Uh, the bill speaks about the phase of implementation. Perhaps if you can reflect on how it's going to be implemented in phases so that South Africans can be patient enough to wait. For, for the proper implementation. And, and, and the number two will be the issue of affordability. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. In terms of uh, implementation, as you've alluded to, the bill itself, uh, you know, starting from the white paper, then now in the bill, which becomes an act uh, after, after uh, 3 p.m. tomorrow. Um, what it unlocks is a, a process of now legally having the instrument to implement uh, that phase one, which has already started in the pre-legal framework po uh, component. I've mentioned already, among very key, has been uh, strengthening the health delivery system. That has already been happening. It needs to be speeded up. Now, you see, when you have an act of parliament, you can now have the strength to go to the Minister of Finance and say this act must be implemented. To implement it, it needs certain resources can we discuss now, not theory. Mm -hmm. But you know, we've been talking uh, theory and there's been good assistance as I mentioned, we've got conditional grants, but now we need to have got time timelines in terms of all those things, the health information systems, making sure everybody is fully registered and all those things needs to now happen. So that's part of our phase one. Mm -hmm. But also very fundamental is the fact that we now have the instrument to set up the actual system. You, once at 3 o'clock tomorrow, there will be the legal framework mm -hmm. to start saying, how do we set up the board? Uh, these are the regulations in terms of inviting, you know, members who can be considered people as, as your laws in, in the country, in terms of the Companies Act, in terms of uh, talk about people of uh, certain definitions in the companies of sound mind and, and uh, you know, good standing, all those issues now you can start going out, put together the actual, you know, institution. You must start the, putting together the institution. I mean, we, we were quite, quite happy that, not the withstanding the fact that we didn't have the actual law, we have started, we put a branch in the department which was funded, we are grateful for Treasury and the Public Service Department for allowing us to create a branch. 
uh, and start actually putting up the posts in terms of various functions uh, of determining the package, the risk assessment, the risk, uh, yeah, all those the risk and, 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 and the, the various aspects of, of that. We take into court by an organization called Solidarity to say we're jumping the gun. We don't have the act, mm. but we already have a branch. Uh, mm. But we argued in court that this is not the NHI fund. It is an NHI branch mm. of the department. And the functions is doing is just preparation. If you argue that the act may not be passed, uh, this can be absorbed into the functions of the department. And the judge agreed with us. Mm. So we're able to already have that. But now we have the full instrument to set up the board, to get the CEO, uh, to make sure that all those committees which must now finalize the package of services, cost, uh, and, uh, how much in, in the capitation. We already started with the capitation model. Uh, it's running already in, nine, in all the nine provinces. Um, and, and, and I'm happy to say that even the province which is governed by a party which is opposed has been very cooperative. Uh, they've been very cooperative we are, we are in one of their districts testing a capitation mm -hmm. model, and okay. we see that it's something which can work. So we're going to be able to now have a full, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, sort of um, amari to be able to launch that and, and accelerate even all the all the systems. And we what we envisage is that in that initial uh, what is left now up to 2026, it's also possible not only to test even the capitation and all the other instruments. But even some level of uh, services, especially at the primary level of package where we can bring in the dentists, the physios, mm -hmm. and so on, and start making sure that some of those services, there is uh, an offer to these professionals to say you can come in uh, if we have certain, I mean, we argue, for instance, that in terms of uh, medical aid tax credits, uh, which, which currently is, 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 is given to us, those who are members, uh, 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 the, the revenue service gives us those credits. Mm -hmm. They are bound to about 30 billion. Yeah. And we believe that if those, if progressively we can just get another 10 billion to start this and, in, and with incremental, we could be able to start in the next uh, year or two offering mm -hmm. universal access mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, dental services, uh, mm -hmm. speech therapy, mm -hmm. and, and all those, especially to the most vulnerable, you know, people, yeah. the, you know, uh, because currently, even though uh, some people got confused to say, but you've got three services at the clinics, but the services access is still limited. Mm. It's only up to uh, the kind of mm. professionals we have. But once you have some additional funding, you can then bring in all these various mm. services uh, to come in and provide at the universal level. So those are the things which incrementally will, will then, mm. at, the, at the first phase, and then come the second phase beyond 2026, we expect that that will then be higher at a higher level, which include also your specialist services. We're starting to test those, bring in specialists and other uh, services. Mm -hmm. So, well, it, you know, we, 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 we do, we're not promising pie in the sky. Yeah. We're promising something doable, properly planned, properly introduced and built from the bottom, but in a very accelerated way, not, not for centuries to wait. Yeah, the last one, Minister, on affordability, affordability here. Yeah. Look, um, <coughs> the system uh, is, it, I mean, it's affordable uh, um, in the sense that already as a country, we're spending much more than many countries in terms of the GDP yeah. of the country. Uh, we are at 8.5%, mm. uh, half of it being spent on the full population of about 85% and the other half, uh, if not a little bit more, and only 15 to 14 to 15%. So, and, and what, 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 what we want to dispel also is the fact that when we say we will bring in integration, including private providers, um, the, the naysayers are looking at the fact that at the current moment, especially uh, um, not so much at the general practitioners, but especially at the, at the specialist services and private hospitals and, 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 and the various, you know, diagnostic costs, x-rays and, and uh, you know, MRI scanners and all those kind of things. 
And, and there's no doubt, and it's been proven also by the health market inquiry, a lot of those are highly inflated. Um, now, with this kind of an approach, you use, you know, what in business is called your uh, volume, what is it called? Economies of scale. Economies of scale, mm. yeah. Mm. You would use economies of scale, uh, and we've done it before. You know, I'll give you an example. When we started with the uh, vaccination of young women, young girls, uh, nine years, eight years, nine years, uh, for uh, human papilloma virus vaccination, mm -hmm. it was very expensive initially. The producers were costing very high. And uh, 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 my predecessor, uh, uh, the lady and the team then approached the companies to say, look, you now selling to few hundreds. We're going to give you millions mm -hmm. of nine-year-olds. So we need to negotiate mm -hmm. the price because you now costing so much in order because you are only, you know, so you can produce at scale and we will, you know, guarantee the uptake. And they, after some hard negotiations, they came to that. And currently we're providing universally uh, in the public schools. Uh, all the young girls mm -hmm. can get access to human papilloma virus vaccination, just as an example. If you look at, for instance, eight, uh, the, the treatment for antiretrovirus, mm -hmm. we also use the same Approach, discussion yeah. with you know, uh, providers to say, you know, we can give you scale. These are the numbers we'll purchase from you, guaranteed. And then they drop the price. And in various other, you know, uh, just recently also in terms of the treatment for uh, uh, drug resistant TB, mm. a drug called Betacule, we also renegotiated the prices and brought them down. So we are saying that in equally so, whether it's hip replacement, whether it's uh, heart surgery, whether it's what, you know, if we use the, the economy of scale, we will guarantee all this, the GPs, the specialists, uh, and we want to assure them that there's no need to, you know, want to flee to other countries. Mm. They will get enough work, uh, but also with, with some kind of certainty in terms of, you know, this is what I'm given to do, and for that, this is how much. And we're quite confident that with that approach, where we can bring down the cost, uh, because that, the reason we're at 8.5%, it's also perverse incentives. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are a lot of stories. I'm sure many of you would have heard mm -hmm. the story around Medi Clinic, you know, mm -hmm. from an inside person about the things which they would do. Uh, somebody who has not been in ICU, and mm -hmm. they put a claim to say they spend five days yeah. in ICU. Mm -hmm. So all those things you can be able to monitor mm -hmm. and, and reduce those perverse incentives. We're quite confident that the, the, the additional contribution from those of us who also have uh, income will be far less than what most of us are paying uh, and will still be able to get good quality access. So it, it is indeed affordable. We, we understand that there is a fear of the unknown. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's understandable, but we want to assure people that this is properly considered and, and it will be able to, to work. Minister, thank you. Thank you very much. And as professionals, we're really encouraged to hear that uh, uh, when you say that uh, the proof of concept is already started in the different districts across all, all provinces where there's an, 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 a working relationship between the department and uh, private pra practitioners, which is the way to go. And you have already started that. You also pre uh, started with the model of capitation. Uh, because one thing when we read the bill, which encourages us is that the, the additional health insurance emphasizes more on prevention than on hospitalization. So uh, if you, you, you can, you have started already on capitation model. It means that there's an incentive for private practitioners to, 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 to have health promotion and other measures of prevention, of preventing diseases before people can get uh, diseases. Uh, thank you very much for that, um, Minister. Okay, Comrade Simpiwe Gada, the chairperson of uh, DINOSA in, in Gauteng. Uh, you represent a very important stakeholder in the implementation of the national health insurance, which, is the, which are the nurses. Without the nurses, national health insurance cannot work. You have been very supportive of the national health insurance uh, since its inception throughout all the different uh, stages that pro or processes that uh, has been undertaken on national health insurance. Tomorrow, it is being signed into, into law. 
what what are you, how are you how, how are you feeling about the, where we are now and how what will be the implication of the signing of the bill tomorrow towards the 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 nursing profession well thanks uh, for the invite and uh, maybe let me also uh, much as I represent this, the, the, the nursing community, let me also put it on record that, uh, you know, broadly as the workers in the country, because DINOSA being part of the, being part of COSAT as an affiliate, we have discussed this issue across all sectors to say what is the broader, you know, implication on, on, on workers. And I think one, we are quite excited that uh, the day has finally arrived. I think even on Friday we indicated that uh, uh, when the president was not finding his pen, that it was our wish that even if he finds the pen midnight, he must sign the bill. I mean, uh, we used to implement things overnight. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are quite excited and looking forward to tomorrow because uh, for us this bill represents many things. Uh, for instance, uh, the already overstretched public health care system, uh, it means that uh, some of the struggles that we always talk about, issues of shortage of staff, the infrastructure will now be addressed because the 84 percent that relies on the public health care system will be stretched now among you know, all health care facilities. Just to make an example, um, uh, let's take for instance Temisa Hospital. Just adjacent to Temisa Hospital is Samogusha, which is owned by uh, MediClinic. So what it means, the beds that are sitting there unutilized will be utilized. And the patients will continue to sleep on the floor in Tembisa because of the lack of beds will now get you know, uh, beds. So what it means is that access to health will now be broader. And, and, and also, you know, as a trade union, uh, not only Dinosa, but all unions, you know, there's a season whereby it's characterized by strikes and so forth, a collective bargaining season. You know, just to simplify it, to say what will be the implication on, on collective bargaining. Currently, workers pay medical aids. And when you go for bargaining, uh, collective bargaining, we talk about the cost of living adjustment. You'll find that out of the salary that the worker has, a certain portion goes towards paying a medical aid. Now, what it means is that the bill is actually practically putting money in the pocket of workers because workers can now choose to to go for, for you know, affordable options in medical aids, or if I'm a worker, I decide I don't want the medical aid, that's fine. Uh, there's no crisis in that, in that aspect. So for us, we look at it that way, that you'll never find now disputes between employees and, you know, and, and employers, because workers will have that room now to afford other things based on what they were spending on health. But what is also important is that uh, when we look at the economy, what it means is that uh, there will be a positive injection into the economy. You will now have, because of the broadened access to health, a worker that works in an industrial site that is next to a private hospital doesn't have to take a day off to be able to, you know, to go and see the doctor, whether it's to collect chronic medication and all those things. So what it means is that workers would spend more time at work, production levels will rise, and that is, is a good injection for the economy. And the positive spin-offs is that when the economy is productive, it produces jobs. But on the level of nursing aspect, one thing that we must emphasize, which, we, which makes us very happy, is that the national health insurance is anchored on the district health system, a system that is closer to the people. So what it means is that um, recently we spoke about doctors that are unemployed. So what it means is that in terms of creating employment, as a doctor, or as a nurse, for instance, I come from Tsomo in the Eastern Cape. I don't have to be in Tobek, for instance. I can open a practice uh, in Tsomo, register my practice with the, with, the, with the fund so that I can be able to offer services because nurses have got practices because nurses do primary health care. So what it means I can go home, work closer to home, and the, the bonus is that in areas where we don't have clinics, albeit the fact that the African national government is really focused on infrastructure, we've got clinics now in the rural areas. But what it means is that as a physiotherapist or any other healthcare worker, I can go closer to home, as the minister has indicated, open up 
you know, a practice. So the people who would not ordinarily have money to travel to town, they come to me. In the process, I will create, you know, employment for the locals. So that is a positive thing. But even for, sm for small businesses, we know that uh, not everybody can be employed, but there are people that have got business aspirations. So what it means is that we are going to open the basket for service providers where we are going to purchase products and all that. We talk about industrialization. That also opens up those opportunities. So when you look at it from a working class perspective, I, we, we, it is our firm conviction that this bill will contribute positively towards solving many social ills that, that we have. Uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, when we say the bill is anchored around the district health system, uh, one of the things that is driving the, the, you know, the, the, the you know, access to health, the prices of health, is the fact that currently government offers what you call voluntary ma male medical circumcision for free. But if you go to a private healthcare group, you can pay up to 10,000. If you go to another healthcare group, you can pay up to 2.5. So the differences in costs, but also what Minister touched on, the pervasive uh, incentives. We know that uh, what we prefer as health workers is that if, for instance, a woman has got to give birth, we prefer the natural way, not the C-section. But what happens in the private sector, because they know that on a C-section, they will make 20,000 or 30,000 from you. So what we're going to do, regulate the prices so that everybody has got, uh, you know, reasonable costs uh, to, 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 to access health. So this is something that should have been done a long time ago. And we, because in this country, we don't have a regulation in terms of the prices. One doctor can charge just for a C-section, can even charge up to 100,000. The other facility can charge 50,000. So these variances will be able to deal with them. And for us, what that means, we're putting money in the pockets of workers. You can be able to deal, you know, afford other things that you are unable to afford. You can go on holiday as a worker because workers don't go on holiday. They are always working. So these are the things that excite us about this bill. And uh, also, some of the interventions, for instance, linking the biometric system into home affairs. We've got uh, patients in the public health care facilities that we don't know their identity. So what it means is that we no longer have to put them up on social media or newspapers. We just, you know, then we're able to identify the patients, we're able to locate their families and all those things. So we will be able to account for each and every cent that we're going to be spending. So what it means, the other question of corruption, automatically is taken care of because this is a pool. We've got regulated prices. We go and make sure. So corruption will be taken care of. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the other issue, I know that many people are opposed to the bill, but uh, would want to also maybe take the opportunity to also persuade them to give it a chance. I mean, uh, for us, it's not a new thing. You know that there was a Triple H campaign that uh, Comrade Krizan was pushing to deal with the crisis of housing, the crisis of, 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 of health as well. So this is also anchored around that kind of a campaign. So this is what even many revolutionaries have been talking about. And today it's coming to reality. And the only thing that uh, from tomorrow after the PM minister is that uh, we know that experts indicate that we must prepare but uh, we should not implement the bill in 2029 because available data suggests that we think that 2029 is far. We must be able to implement because that NHI branch has done a lot of work. And there's a health worker in Gauteng. I'm confident that our facilities in Gauteng are ready to roll out the national health insurance because on a yearly basis, we've got what we call uh, assessments that we do. Uh, which are conducted by the Office of the Health Standard Compliance, just to check that does this facility qualify to be called a hospital in terms of the National Health Care Act. And there are certain things that are not negotiable that each facility must have. Some we call them not the, the, the NNVs, you know, non-negotiable vitals, that each hospital must have those things. And these things are done. When you assess in terms of the performance of hospital, the performance indicators, uh, that each CEO, each, each hospital has got to report on. 
which fits into a central point of data, which is what I'm saying, that the health system is anchored around the district. So each hospital on a monthly basis is monitored to say, uh, in terms of patient experience of care, where are you sitting? Uh, in terms of the ideal hospital, where are you sitting? These are things that are done independently. Um, and, and every first quarter of the year, district hospitals must have been assessed in how they've got hospitals that have, that already at this moment, if we're to say we're accrediting tomorrow, they'll get accredited. So we're quite confident that uh, we are indeed ready to roll out the national health insurance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Simpiwe, for giving that the background in terms of the impact that it will have in terms of uh, nurses and general uh, health workers in general. Um, I think if you can just reflect more on the relief that uh, the NHI, the NHI will have and the uh, overcrowding of, of nurses uh, work because there will be increased utilization but as you point out that the, uh, the entry point into the system will be the primary health care mm -hmm. and then it means that there will be broadened in terms of service providers you'll have your GPs you'll have the nurses who are in private practice mm -hmm. you'll have the other clinics whether private Public. I think in that way it will come as a relief to the overcrowding of, of services by the nurses. Mm. The second one will be the, in the discrepancy in terms of payment for nurses who are working in the public sector and nurses that are working in the private sector. Mm. When we read the bill, the bill says it's, it's going to equalize, meaning that a service provider who is in the private sector and several on the provider who is in the public sector, they will be remunerated on the same scale. So will that, how, what impact will that have in terms of uh, reducing migration from public sector to private sector? Well, to, to just put it simply, it means that uh, uh, the example I made, for instance, I mean, just at the back here, we've got a hospital, the Dr. Uh, Donald Gordon Hospital. Yeah. I can assure you now, if you look at the time, nurses in the public hospitals and doctors because the shift ends at seven, <laughs> they are doing their final rounds now. Yeah. Nurses in the private hospital are sitting because the beds are empty, so they don't have enough patients that they can look after. Those are wasted resources. So what it means will effectively, because this narrative that this country doesn't have enough nurses is not properly unpacked. And, and what we mean by that is that uh, if you look at the South African Nursing Council, you look at all the nurses that are you know, enrolled or that are registered with the nursing council. You take a percentage, a, a huge chunk works in the public sector. Then there's a chunk that works in the, in, the, in, the, in the private sector, which is not being fully utilized. So what the bill seeks to do is that let's utilize all available resources. And I think that has already been demonstrated. Look at the successes of, of, of the vaccination, the COVID vaccination. Look at the successes of the rollout of uh, the antiretroviral treatment. I mean, uh, if you look at the life expectancy, back then uh, when we spoke about uh, HIV positive people, we did not expect them to pass 50 years. Then it went up to 55 years. But now as we speak, an HIV positive person can live a normal life up to 78 years. As long as they stick on their treatment, they're virally suppressed and all those things. So what it means is that as, as, as far as shortage of staff and the adequate use of resources is that there's no nurse that is going to sit, there's no doctor that will sit and do other things. We're going to make sure that we distribute evenly all the people that require healthcare services. So, in fact, what this bill seeks to do is to do the private sector a favor because their infrastructure is sitting. And uh, I always argue to say that People say the infrastructure in the public system is worn out. But if you take the number of people who use the public health care system, you take them to, let's take this one here down the road, a uh, mail park. Take the number of people who are using the public health care system. I can tell you the infrastructure, the lifts that are working, they will now see the rise in terms of their overheads, how much they pay for maintenance and all those things. So what we are doing, we are helping them to utilize you know, the resources that they have. So that's what we are essentially doing when we do this. And by the way, 
I've, I've, we have always, you know, argued that, you know, the private health care is, you know, is overrated. I can tell you that during COVID, many people passed away just down the road here at, at, at uh, what is that thing, Mill Park. That's where miss, celebrities were rushing there. Ordinary people were relying on the public health care system. Today they are with me and you, they are still alive. Celebrities are no longer with us. That's what it means. So just to simplify it, that the doctors who work in the private health care system are the doctors who are employed in the public health care system. Uh, uh, maybe my colleagues will fight with me, but I've got to say this. Some of our colleagues actually steal time from the public sector yeah, by true. going to work in the private sector. The hospital that I work in, which uh, I've been given responsibilities to work in that hospital, from time to time, I do unannounced visits to check who is on call, is that person in the facility. Then we trace them. You find that what they do, they will split a call, whereby one will go and work. If you work, you are on call for a weekend. One works Saturday, one works Sunday, but they claim both days. So, that is corruption, because when we talk corruption, we look at it at a bigger scale. This bill will deal with those things. Uh, 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 so we'll not talk about the shortage of staff. We'll talk about the adequate use of available resources. That's what we're going to do. But also, as I've indicated, that generally it's going to improve the quality of life of workers in the sense that workers will be able to afford more now because they will have money that is being put on their pocket. Uh, the issues of prices, I cannot overemphasize that. Uh, we always condemn that, uh, uh, as you have asked that. We, we always condemn. We just think that it is totally unethical for a private healthcare group to be listed on the JSE as if it's trading in gold or diamonds and all those things. Because as we speak, I go to the JSE and you go and look there uh, uh, how some of these, you'll find that, uh, uh, I don't want to mention them by name, but they know themselves that uh, these healthcare groups are there on the JSE. And what is it that they are trading on? Access to, to, yeah, to, to yeah. health. And that is not, it cannot be ethically correct. So what we are saying is that nobody chooses to be sick. Health is not a privilege. Health is a right. The bill seeks to address that and ensure that there's equity as far as access to health care. That's what we're trying to do here, and that is why we support the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Simpiwe. I think before we can give maybe the minister to give the closing remarks that we've got uh, from the audience, if you've got any questions that you'd like to pose, whether to the minister or Comrade Simpiwe, please feel free. Anyone? Thank you. Oh. I, I, I have the mic. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, please, please proceed. Yeah, I, I, I'll ask something that was briefly touched on. I think when the announcement was made by the president that there will be a signing tomorrow, a lot of people were reacted to say, well, this is another ANC corruption scheme. So I know, for example, that since the piloting that has started some 10 years back, there has been uh, institutions that are being set up to safeguard the system from, from, from corruption. So I want to ask from the minister, what are the safeguards uh, that the people must be aware of that government has established to ensure that the system itself is protected and that the workers and even the patients will be protected from any other form of corruption? So I don't know if I should rotate the mark or the minister will respond. Yeah, I think the minister will respond at once. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Is that fine, minister? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, um, I think touching on what you said, in addition to the corruption, people are also concerned, um, or rather members of the public, NGOs, or medical, um, or, as well as the medical aid schemes, are concerned about you know the collapsing or how um, the 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 public health care seems to be failing and collapsing. And so, Minister, you touched on it, especially from an, from an accelerated time frame perspective that it is being rolled out. But for, you know, just a, a simple member of the public, just to paint the picture for, for them that, what does it actually look like from a time frame perspective? So in a year from now, where would we be? Because as it takes, for example, currently, it, it takes maybe six to eight months for um, someone to get maybe um, a, 
um, to get a, a date for an operation, right, or to get uh, to get something done for them medically. So how does it? So yeah. So how does it? So then how does that change once now um, the bill has been implemented and it's been running and, and, and it has been set up and executed? So 12 months from now. Where, where would we be? Would it be six months, four to five months, um, not just from a getting a date um, perspective, but also from an infrastructure pers um, perspective, from the efficiency also, you know, when they walk into a, a, a public um, hospital, how do they, like, how differently does that look from now? Thank you. Uh, Minister, from my side, the burning question that has been uh, found in many spaces we've been engaging as young people and young professionals is uh, what happens to my medical aid if I have one? Uh, do I cancel it? And at the same time is the, the crisis of uh, where does the funding come from mainly from our taxation? What is the model from the, for the taxation at that time? And uh, what is the employee and employee contribution once the NHI is implemented? Thank you. Oh, okay, Minister, um, going back to the, like, if it's affordable, like, approximately how much will it be, like, monthly? And, uh, yeah, what will happen to our private hospitals, um, yeah, from, from now on, after, after it's passed? Anybody here? Okay, please. Now, is there anyone else? Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Uh, Minister, I think you have noted them. Uh, uh, if you've missed any, we'll be able to assist you. But I think you can, you can go ahead and respond. Well, <clears throat> the, the issue of uh, corruption, we have said uh, on various forums, that it's a valid concern. <clears throat> it's a valid concern in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, there's no argument about the fact that, uh, you know, from pre-democracy right into democracy, uh, the challenge of you know prudent management of public resources has been an issue. Uh, that's why you end up with the Zondo Commission, <coughs> all those. So it's not something which we are oblivious about. That people should be concerned about what happens to any public resources, and and that's why even before uh, the fund. Um, uh, just in the run-up, just before COVID, we came together with uh, various agencies, health department, uh, uh, SIU, uh, uh, from the, the police, uh, Oaks, and you know various other institutions to constitute a health sector anti-corruption uh, forum, which gives very regular reports and indicates where there are red flags in terms of issues which needs to be uh, checked. So, so um, that forum will have to be uh, capacitated and strengthened with more capacity uh, as, as, as we move forward. So uh, we're not sweeping the issue of being conscious about prudent care of, of public uh, resources. Uh, but also, as uh, Comrade Simpiwe indicated, that the, the, the other thing which uh, will be evident, I'm sure, even as we move forward, is the fact that the manner in which this, uh, this system is, is premised on is not your kind of a tender system where, you know, uh, a certain uh, uh, Dr. Mkari here will tender, <laughs> you know. Um, it's it's um, a capitation system and also at the higher level, what is called a DRG base, is essentially <clears throat> where we agree ahead, ahead of time when we enter into an agreement to say, um, this is the burden of disease you are a specialist in, in eyes, you know. Uh, you are an ophthalmologist, optician. Uh, this is in this area of, of uh, um, Soweto. This is the burden of eye disease. 
uh, it's uh, a cataract, it's uh, acute eye infections, this and that, and so on and so on. This is the study. This is the pattern of this kind of disease for this kind of population. To provide a reasonable service. So if you are so many ophthalmologists, opticians in practice, this is the kind of, uh, on an average monthly, six months annually, this is the number of people you will be servicing. And therefore we're going to sit, come with a properly research to say in that area, therefore for you to look after the population as in the register, you will need so much, you know, on average. And of course these things will be reviewed. So uh, there will have to be quality control, but because it's not a, a kind of fee for service. You see what the problem is that over time, pre-democracy and after democracy, in the private health provision, we, we inherited a fee for service, and even under democracy, we, we continued with fee for service. And what was even worse is that because of maybe some loopholes, sometime I mean, uh, uh, on the regulatory side, which is what the uh, Judge Nobles Commission uh, found was, was, uh, was lacking, was the regulatory framework, even in terms of pricing. So we allowed, uh, we went too far with this free market, you know, on a matter which, as a patient, you have no control over. So those are the things which, which, which therefore, so because of also the, the system under which this, this will operate, uh, you will have to have good supervision, make sure people get quality service. If you are underperforming, then you are taken out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because it's not a fee for service, um, if, uh, uh, if you are a provider of the X-ray services, for instance, these are the pattern in terms of injuries and so on. These are the kind of machines you're going to be providing. These are your expenses and so on. So uh, on an average of this kind of service, uh, per, per month, per year, and so on, this is your compensation and all that. So it's going to drastically reduce. You see, the, the thing which was in the news, for instance, about uh, one of the, uh, well, because it was public, it was many clinic. I mean, it was, in the, it was in the public and it was an inside story reported where they would, somebody who's been in the general ward, when they claimed, they say, five days in ICU. Because the cost of being in the general ward, the ICU is almost five to ten times what they can claim from a medical scheme or even if you're a paid fee, I mean, a private pay patient. So, so because of those incentives, I mean, uh, just as an example, you know, I was going to find the other time, one of our colleagues who's a doctor, you know, got sick, uh, rushed to a hospital here uh, in, in Santen. <laughs> they didn't know he was a doctor. So he arrives there and then they say, oh, emergency, what, what, and so on, abdomen. And then they inform the specialist there. He says, no, bring him to theater. He wants to cut him. <laughs> so this could, yeah. yeah. Commercial visit. So he hasn't even it's examined him. Hey. So the colleague said, cut me for what? Mm. You haven't done A, B, C, D. Mm. Started asking, yeah. They didn't know he's a doctor. So he started questioning. Then they said, oh, this guy knows a lot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then they had to, he said, no, but how does this man want to mm. operate me when he has not even seen me? He hasn't done A, B, C, D. He hasn't mm. done A, B, C, D, and so on. And then they had to stop, and then ultimately they apologized. Because when they did the things which you are saying you haven't done, they confirmed that he doesn't need operation. Mm. And then one of the staff members said, hey, you helped us. This man, he's like, the management here likes him because he cuts everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then they don't, they stay not less than 14 days after cutting. So the hospital is always busy, the theaters are busy, and so on. So these are the kind of things which, with this, uh, the approach, then, then even the cesarean sections. I mean, the private health, already have passed 80% of cesarean sections. Mm. Far above norms. The norms should be about 20%. Mm. They are already at more than 80% of a cesarean section, so every woman must be cut, because mm. it's theater and all that, and, and all that. So there are certain uh, 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 sort of steps which will help. The collapsing of uh, health service, let me say, uh, you know, uh, and I've said this in a number of forums to say, the public health system of South Africa is quite resilient. 
and COVID has shown that. Uh, uh, I was just indicating, I mean, I know, and, 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 and it's not only in the peak, you know, we're talking with the MEC of Limbabwe, we say, hey, people no more want to go to private because they, they see that more people are actually coming alive mm -hmm. from the public hospitals than from the private because they are not organized in such a way to handle big volumes. Mm -hmm. Now, when people come in big numbers at one time, they just can't cope. Whereas in the public, people know how to reorganize mm -hmm. and make sure that the emergency ones are catered for and so on. So then, then uh, the system, the, the, there's pressure, of course, and as a result, there's also, we acknowledge that there's weaknesses even in, in, in some areas. Uh, they are, uh, his colleagues, uh, by the way, is also a CEO. Uh, of a hospital. So some of his colleagues are not really applying their, their, their minds. They are not really diligent in their work. And that's correct. We need to improve on that. But there's also just high volumes of pressure. Um, so as a result, because as you were saying, I mean, if you can just one day cause, a, cause some a disruption and say all the people who on that day were going to Barra must be redirected to Mill Park, all of them. Ah. I can tell you this place will collapse. This neighbor in the hospital, Mill Park, yeah, it will come to its knees. They won't cope. You see? So it's those kind of things. But so it's, it's in a way, it's also uh, exaggerated. But notwithstanding that, that's why we're saying if we share uh, the burden and, and make sure that all the others take some of the burden, but also invest in efficiencies, uh, in management and supervision and uh, there are some weaknesses which we must be able and those don't even and, and we've been doing that they just need to be accelerated but we we will be very honest to say because of the the pressure and the limited resources as we expand the the, the, the financial resources we will not lie to people and say you know sign tomorrow come june everything will be honky dory we have to we are saying up front it will need investment that's why we said two years uh, it doesn't mean that nothing will be done i mean as i've already indicated even just record system many of our public hospitals because of the numbers and outdated just health record management people spend a lot of time because they are looking for the file you know so all that already most of the the places were uh, digitizing and all that Okay, maybe I see my time is out. What happened to the medical aid schemes? Very short. In terms of uh, what we are saying is, and what is in the bill is that uh, um, the, 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 the coverage package of, of, of coverage by NHI will be incremental. At any given time when certain services are covered, the medical private schemes will be excluded from covering. If, for instance, we, we reach a stage where we can say uh, all the primary health, uh, you know, is now covered uh, in terms of the scheme, including teeth, mm -hmm. hearing, everything. We've got audiologists, we've got everybody in, in, uh, I mean, within the scheme. There will be no need, so the schemes must start reducing. Mm -hmm. And when it's fully implemented, yeah when all the various key services, then the medical schemes can only cover maybe your cosmetic yeah. surgery and, and so mm, on. Complementary services. Yeah, what yeah. is called complementary services. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's where it's going. Um, how much affordable? Um, because we, we need to, and, and this testing which I'm talking about, the capitation which we're already implementing at various levels, um, we are not able, uh, you know, immediately, and I know that the naysayers want to pin us down to say how much, how much it's going to cost. All that we can say is that far less than what we are currently spending, especially in terms of additional spending, because, as I've indicated, at every given time, uh, because we'll have to look at what is uh, prevailing cost and so on, and, 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 and use the economics of, of scale, and, and make sure that this can be brought down. I mean, uh, people are drowning, you know, in uh, annual increase, uh, sometimes 5,000, 6,000, what, what, and so on. So we're saying that all those 
will, 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 you know, unfortunately, I mean, at, 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 at regular intervals, we'll be able to then say, this is where we are, and this is what we have reached the, the agreement in terms of this kind of service. When the private hospitals will still be there, um, so you don't have to throw away your medical aid, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, um, and there will be far stricter regulation even for them, even in terms of how much they can start keep on increasing. So that's what we want to strengthen. Private hospitals will remain, but they will not, as increasingly as this get implemented, they will not have the liberty to just say, you bring your child for circumcision, even though it can be done for 400 francs, <laughs> because it's, uh, you've got nice television here, it will be 10,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the things. Uh, all this, uh, and I can just, maybe as I end, just to say, you know, without being soliciting, I mean, the, the CEO of just the very hospital we've been referring to here, the company which under the, I was here one day for they were introducing some machines and they invited me to come and just, you know, uh, be part of them. And he was saying to me, hey, you know, uh, we, we, we tried to operate in, in the UK. Uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't cope uh, because they, they give you the price. Mm -hmm. They tell you <laughs> that uh, you, you can be able to provide this service. And he was given an example to say the extraction of cataracts from the eyes. They, can, they tell you there's 10,000 patients for cataract, but you'll be paid so much. And he says, hey, we tried, we tried. We have to come back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Because here there's no price, mm -hmm. you just okay, can. the price. Uh, maybe just to oh, just okay. just one one last point, which I think it's it's important, which I did not get to answer. I think the the narrative that the private sector pays workers better than the public sector is also false. Mm -hmm. We must clarify that because as things stand in the public sector, if you are a primary health care nurse, you get paid for that specialist. In the private sector, you don't get paid for that you know, specialization. Yeah. So it's important to highlight that the bill will also bridge those gaps because uh, when we purchase the services, we'll be able to say, let's make sure that we standardize how health workers are paid. Because I can tell you, a nurse that has worked in the public sector retires comfortably than the one who has worked in the private sector. In fact, most of those who have worked mm -hmm. in the private sector are beneficiaries of SASA now because the, 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 the structure of the pension the total package as well of what you earn is not the same. So that narrative, we must put it. In fact, many of our colleagues who go to <coughs> overseas, they go to the private sector, they are now coming back to work for the public sector because they realize that, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> we, we, we pay better. But also, the last thing is that uh, in terms of the, there was a question about the long uh, list of, uh, of, of theaters. Mm -hmm. I, I, like in co during COVID, we could not operate. In Gauteng, we have embarked upon a, 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 a project where we, we call it, you, you know, we're dealing with the surgical backlogs. So what it actually means, if we're operating under NHI, the theaters that are lying dormant, even in the private hospitals, would be utilized. The surgeons would, would have work to do now. So that's what it means. So private hospitals are not being done away with. Instead, they are being assisted to do more when they work. And also, it's not automatic that public hospitals will be accredited. We have got to apply, meet a certain level of standard. So the, the, the standard of health is not going to drop. We're going to maintain high quality levels of health that is the same, both public and private. I thought that those yeah. points are very much important to understand that the bill is here to do away with discrimination. It doesn't matter how much you have in the bank, you must access the same quality of health care as a billionaire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Comrade Simpiwe from Tinosa. Thank you, Minister, for the clarifications that you have, you have, you have, you have, you have a broaden on and ensure that we understand the bill better and what the implication is. I think uh, the issue of affordability, the minister has covered it very well, but the bill is also clear that the um, uh, uh, national health insurance will, uh, will, will cover services at the pace and rate which the economy will afford. Hence, the minister speaks about progressive implementation. 
meaning that uh, it won't be the, this need will be identified, but what is available at that point in time will then be covered with the available resources and not more than what is covering things that are more than what is available. I think that is an important point. And the point that the comrade uh, the CPW has made in terms of the role of the private hospitals. Private hospitals will be a service provider, uh, will be accredited like any other service providers. So they will be utilized by the National Health Insurance and they will be paid for, for their services. So they will continue to exist. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you.